Again, 104 in this book. And then I know, Deborah, you have the orange book usually. Yes. 140, the bottom of 140. 140 in the orange book. And the white book, anyone? No? Okay. All right, so 140 in the orange book, 104 in this book. And at the bottom of the page with the paragraph, as Gila mentioned, it starts with even though. So, all right, just to recap very quickly, we were speaking about uh, the search for oneself, for the deeper self, and how this question is really a question that ought to be asked throughout life. And it's probably the most essential question of the human existence. Who am I? And um, who am I called to be? Um, now, of course, this question also has another side to it. And that is, where am I? Because who am I focuses only on the I. Where am I focuses also on our surroundings, on the you. And sometimes we don't, we don't know who I am because it happens. We're, we're either too numb or maybe where we've gone to, through too many hardships and the I is too concealed. But um, uh, the question of where am I still must be answered. And uh, although we don't know exactly sometimes who we are, we still have a responsibility towards others and towards bettering this world. Um, that's an idea that we shared. Another idea, one last point that we shared and we spoke about last time, and that is that, um, um, you know, uh, we spoke about masks, this idea of wearing different masks. And there are masks that are the antidote to the eye and there are masks that actually synchronize or harmonize well with the eye. And the goal of life is not necessarily to not wear masks, but rather to wear masks that are in sync with the deepest eye. So for example, if the deepest eye is a soul, as it is by each and every one of us, the deepest eye is a, is a, is a divine soul, then wearing a mask of goodness, of doing good, of smiles even, of spreading joy, that mask is a mask that is in sync with the eye. Other masks might not be in sync with that eye and therefore should be abolished. But wearing mask is not necessarily a bad thing. That was the big idea last time. As long as those masks, again, are completely in sync with the soul. So that was the big idea, I think, last time that we conveyed. Let's continue on with um, this paragraph here. Even though the question of the self, bottom of page 104, does anyone want to read? I'll read. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Sue. Go for it, please. Even though the question of the self is one that has since the beginning of time been contemplated by many profound minds, it is not really a philosophical problem. Philosophical, psychological, or scientific treatment of it only provides different frameworks and forms of expressions for answers that are in any case continuously being proven inadequate. Philosophy, psychology, and science all merely isolate the basic problem within an observable small field where it can in turn be broken down into secondary problems, every one of which may by itself be important and certainly interesting, but taken together nevertheless seem far removed from any truly satisfactory response to the question of one's place in the world. Such a response can come only from within. It cannot be supplied within any other frame of reference or merely by ideas or symbols. Right, right. So you have you have many answers to this question of where am I? And Yerav Ashtansi in this short paragraph dismisses them all. Uh, but you have many answers both in the philosophical field, in the scientific field, and in other fields to the question of who am I? So just a few examples come to mind, right? Rene Descartes, the French mathematician, would say cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. So you are your thoughts. Now, it might be true in a very general sense, but it still doesn't answer the very personal question of who am I? Uh, who am I? Not just in my thoughts, but who am I in my essence, in my purpose, in my calling? So that question, that definition is dismissed. You have the, the scientific or maybe the, you know, the, the health uh, definition of we are what we eat. That's another example that comes to mind, right? But again, your food doesn't define you. 
doesn't define your your calling, your purpose, your own soul, your your essence. So again, that's 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 not adequate. And the more you dig into that question of who am I and look at it from different perspectives, philosophical, scientific, etc., the more you realize that they may be true in in abstract or in, in very general terms, but they're not true for the personal self. And the reason for that, as Rabbi Schnauz is alluding to here, is because every eye is really different. My eye is not the same as your eye. If if there were two eyes, they were exactly the same. There really wouldn't be a need for a second eye. If someone's exactly like me in the world, then why the need for me? Then then someone's already doing me. But God created us very differently because everyone is different. Uh, 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 because everyone has a different purpose. Everyone has a different calling. It's a different uh, um, uh, path in life. There's a different note to play, so to speak. Now, the, 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 that question of what is my note? What note should I play? Who is that me? That question can be answered not by philosophy, not by science, not by any other field. The only person that can answer that question is me and me alone. And that's why, again, even though other fields may relate to this question, no one relates to them adequately when it comes to the very personal me, to my very personal self. Rabbi? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For a, some time, I've been wanting to do the um, accounting of the Omer. Yes. Yeah. And you know, I haven't done it yet, but I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> but I mean, it would be just like me, very analytical. And it sounds like wait, a little bit about like what you're saying to really right. get to know your, yourself. Right, right, right. Uh, First of all, the counting of the Omer is coming up in- After Purim, right? Exactly, yeah, after the yeah, second night of pa Passover. So, or, so it's never too late. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I would love to, yeah. to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. But secondly, you're right. The, the whole idea, mystical idea of the counting of the Omer, those of you uh, who know this beautiful custom between Passover and Shavuot, custom is to count oh, every Shavuot, night. Yeah. Right. And uh, every week too, the seven weeks, is in order to really self-refine, uh, to refine ourselves and to engage in introspection. And to, to really focus on every attribute of the soul. Altogether, there are 49 attributes, the seven general attributes, but each attribute includes the other. So seven times seven is 49, which is the number of days between Passover and Shavuot. And therefore, each and every day of those 49 days, we focus on a different attribute and we try and refine it. And you're right. So that exercise that occurs during the 49 days of the Omer during the counting of the Omer, is, a, is very much in line with what we're speaking about because it's an exercise to really get to know ourselves and to, in a way, actualize, ensure that every side of ourselves is, is actualized. So, yeah, yeah, good point. Um, oh. Yeah. Hey, Rabbi? Yes. Rabbi, I just wanted to say to Ilona yes, that there are books on it, but there's also an app for counting the Omer. Yeah, I think I have it. It's a little book that, yeah, uh, there it's is. by, um, I can't think of, of his name, but. It's Rabbi Simon Jacobson. Yes, yeah. I have that. I think that's what you're referring to. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. There's and, even an app on the phone, just right. saying. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is, it best, uh, is it best done individually or is it something of you know, you could do together or somebody yeah, have a... either or either or either or and you know what now you inspired me because i know you know rabbi simon jacobson was here last year for the soul conference yeah and i've developed a very close friendship with him and uh, maybe we'll invite him to zoom with us and speak about those 49 attributes for the counting of the omer that would be lovely that would be great. Of course, the best resource we have, Eliana, is, is Rabbi Alush. I mean, he's uh, the Yeah, no, I would disagree, but thank you, Hannah. No, no, well, how many people agree with me? No, okay, thank you. Stick to, stick to admitting people on Zoom, not to... <laughs> I am, I am. <laughs> All right, okay. But uh, I just want to, uh, you know, speaking of those 49 attributes, which is, by the way, it's true that this is an exercise done during the 49 days of the Omer, between Passover and Shavuot, but 
we don't have to wait for the Omer to focus on the 49 attributes. <laughs> but speaking of the 49 attributes, I will say something that speaks to this question of who am I? And that is that, um, you know, it's interesting to note because um, we are, as we said, every one of us is different, but we're also different in uh, the amount of uh, dosage God gave us for each and every attribute. What I mean to say is that, for example, there's the attribute of kindness, and there's also the attribute of justice. Now, some people are naturally kind. Some people are the opposite. They're naturally just and severe and very in the box and very, you know, very measured. Now, that has a lot to do with who, who we are. What, who am I, right? When you ask the question of who am I, you have to ask yourself, well, how much dosage of kindness did I receive versus the dosage of justice? Am I more kind naturally or am I ju more just naturally? And I think that, that that's why also the, the Kabbalist uh, made a point to, to, um, to um, link the biblical figures that we know of to different attributes. So for example, Abraham, was the attribute of kindness. He was a man that was given a huge dosage of kindness. It was very hard for him to say no and very easy for him to say yes and to invite guests to the point that he was so kind that the Talmud teaches us that when Abraham was alive here in this world, the angel of kindness came to God and said, I don't need to work anymore. He was, he was <laughs> retired because Abraham would do his work in this world. That's how kind Abraham was. On the other hand, now Abraham knew that and therefore he was very much a man of kindness. He wanted to actualize himself and he knew that he was the attribute of kindness and therefore he needed to do kind deeds. But on the other hand, knowing that also enabled him to understand something deeper and that is that sometimes it would be hard for him to say no. It would be hard for him to act in a just way because, again, he's a man of kindness. But that doesn't mean that he should not, not act in a just way. Sometimes just acting in a just way, in a severe way, is what it was required of him, of God. And therefore, he was able to also say, well, even though my nature is kindness, to fulfill the commandment of God, I sometimes need to go against my natural instinct of kindness. Where do we see that? And maybe it's something we've spoken about, but it's really one of the most moving passages in the Torah. That's when Abraham is asked to go and bind his son, Isaac, and sacrifice him, right? We all know the story. Now, he, um, he fulfills the commandment against his own nature. Man, this is a man of kindness, and he has to now include justice. But he does so because he's a servant of God, and he's able to go against his kindness just to fulfill God's will. And after three days, a three-day journey, and after passing the test where he's about to sacrifice his son, and an angel stops him, says, stop, stop, Abraham, don't do it. Um, and he sacrifices a ram eventually instead of his, his own son. And God reveals himself to Abraham and says, yadati, ki elokim ata, velo Which means, now I know, Abraham, that you are God-fearing. Now, what does this mean? Abraham was a servant of God that had passed already nine difficult tests to, that God had put in his way. Only now God knows that he's God-fearing? He had to wait till the 10th test? What does that mean? He didn't prove himself already? But the answer is because here Abraham in this 10th test had to go against his nature. His nature was a nature of kindness. He had to, to sacrifice his son against it. When God saw that, he said, okay, maybe all the kindness that you did until now was for your own sake, because that's your nature. But now that I see that you did something against your nature for me, now I know that you are God-fearing. Now I know that you're doing it for me. Now, why am I mentioning this example? Because speaking on the 49 attributes, again, everyone has to ask themselves, well, what's my nature? My nature of kindness. And we have to work with our nature, not fight it. Work with it. With people of kindness, then let's do kind deeds. But we also have to know and keep ourselves in check as we answer this question of who am I and keep ourselves in check in the sense that we have to say, well, 
Are we doing this? Are we actualizing the me just for me, for, for my sake, just because I care about my nature or my, the pleasure that my nature brings me? Or am I doing this for a greater purpose? Am I doing this for God? Once I've answered, who am I? Am I not actualizing my, my I for me? Or am I actually actualizing my I for God? And that's a question to keep in mind as we explore this question of who am I? Because even when we find the I, even if we, when we know which attribute is linked to our nature, or which attributes in the plural tense are linked to our nature, we still ought to devote that nature to God himself, not to be me for me, but to be me for a greater calling, which is what Abraham again demonstrates with the binding of Isaac. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm chesed heavy and gavura poor. <laughs> but, uh, like Abraham, like but, Abraham. <laughs> T. Ferris, maybe. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, a great, there's a great story about Rabbi Naftali of Rapshitz. It was one of the great Hasidic masters. He was pretty wealthy. And uh, one, every year, a poor person would come to him and ask him for money, and he would give him generously. Now, um, the, the um, one year that same, the same poor person came to him and Rabbi Naftali Rabshit welcomed him warmly and he gave him this bag of coins as he would do every year and they, they bid farewell. The poor man leaves his house, he's walking in the street and then he hears Rabbi Naftali of Rabshit running after him. He turns around and says, Rabbi Naftali, we just spoke to each other. You just gave me your tzedakah. What do you want from me? And Rabbi Naftali of Rabshit said, well, when you came, to my house and to my office, I noticed that you had torn clothes and that you were in a dire state. So I gave you tzedakah because I had mercy on you. But now I'm running after you to give you a second bag of coins so that I can fulfill the mitzvah of tzedakah just for the mitzvah. Not because I have mercy, not because it's me feeling something. I want to do the mitzvah because it's God commanding me to give to the poor. So here's a second bag of coins. <laughs> now, that's the story of our Naftali of Rapshitz, but it was, by the way, a tr tr truly a brilliant Hasidic master who was known for his intellectual analysis of every situation, and which is more or less what he did here. By the way, we knew that of Rabbi Naftali from a very young age. When he was five years old, someone stopped him in the street and said to him, Rabbi Naftali, I'll give you a coin if you can tell me where God is found. Rabbi Naftali, the five-year-old, answered back. He said, I'll give you two coins if you tell me where God cannot be found. <laughs> that was the brilliance of this young kid. But uh, Rabbi Naftali of Rapshitz again, here teaches us that sometimes we ought to do things not for me. Even if it's good things, we ought to do them nonetheless. You know, have mercy of someone to actualize. But let's also remember as I'm answering the who am I question, that we are not, we are not in this just for ourselves or in the words of Hillel the elder, if I'm only for myself, then who am I? Then what am I? Sorry. Okay, then it's true. What am I? I have to do this for a greater purpose. So I'm giving tzedakah maybe now just because my natural instinct tells me to do that. Let me give tzedakah also just because it's tzedakah, just because it's a commandment. And that's not, it's not an easy thing to achieve. Certainly not. <clears throat> but I think that's why, you know, to, to be as practical as possible. I think that's why every one of us, including myself, should do a mitzvah that's uncomfortable for us every day. Not just those that are comfortable, because those that are comfortable, maybe we're doing them just for us. But those that are uncomfortable, that we know we're doing it them for God, because they're uncomfortable. We wouldn't do them for ourselves. They're taking us, they're taking us out of our comfort zone. Maybe the way to do this, to achieve that level that Rabbi Naftali is speaking about, Rabbi Steinzalt is speaking about here, is to do a mitzvah that's uncomfortable for us each and every day. Think about it. <laughs> Rabbi, could I ask a, a question? Yes, please, Gila. I don't want to digress at all, but no, sure. in line with what you're saying, um, I recently heard a talk by um, someone that you may know um, Rabbi, uh, South African Rabbi, Rabbi Akiva Tats. Um, Tats. Yeah. And he, he was talking about 
free will and nikudata bhira, the point of choice. It sounds like what you're describing is that in terms of mitzvot, in terms of our inclinations, our nature, yes, we could be more on the side of chesed, kindness, or more on the side of gavura, of um, justice. There is a moment in time where the rabbi that you were um, describing took an action and he ran after the poor man. That moment was a moment of choice. And it sounds like that's exactly what you're saying is that what's comfortable is easy. If we're wealthy and we give tons of money, it's pretty easy. But if we're not wealthy and we really dig in to offer funds to someone, that's a moment where we're really going beyond. And so is there any connection to this uh, the point of choice? It's, it's pretty complex, right? Free will and all that, but I don't wanna digress from what we're talking. Right. And in line with what you've said, is there anything you can add? Yeah, no, that's a great point. Look, I would add that the definition of nekudata pira or freedom of choice is that we live in a world in which we are sometimes forced to make a decision between choosing the right path or the wrong path. But um, the goal is not to be stuck in that mode of always having to make that decision between the right path and the wrong path. The goal is to be elevated to a higher level so that we are not, as we've spoken about, I believe in the past, that we don't have freedom of choice, but we have freedom from choice. What that means is that I am so refined, I'm so elevated, I've, uh, I'm so in tune with God, that wrong, the wrong path doesn't speak to me anymore, doesn't attract me at all. And therefore, even when I'm facing you know, a crossroad between wrong and good, between the right path and the wrong path, and I don't, I don't want, I, I'm not even attracted to the wrong path anymore. I automatically, almost automatically choose the right path, the good path. Now, uh, in the context of who am I, and thank you for bringing this up, because I think that that's the ultimate goal, is to answer the question of who am I by saying, I am God, of God himself, but I'm a piece of God. Now, if you know and if you feel with every part of your body and your soul and your essence and your psyche that you are a part of God, then anything that is not godly, you're not attracted to. You don't want to do it anymore. If I really am it's almost like, you know, King Louis the 16th, who was a French king, um, who was uh, who suffered a coup d'etat and he was uh, abolished and uh, and and sent away and his son was supposed to be the next one in, in line to become the king, um, was also kidnapped and, and he was presented with all of these different temptations and seductions for six months. And what the, the goal of course was trying to make him forget that he's a king, that he's not royal. But he withstood every single temptation and I asked him after six months, how did you do this? And he responded, it's very easy, I was born to be a king. So I can't fall in these traps. And if we know very deeply and very fully that we are a part of God, then, then again, no seduction, no temptation will speak to me. Then I'm free from choice. Then, then I'd be able really to live an elevated life, a divine life in which I do what God wants me to do. And I do the right thing, therefore. But I think that's where the Nekudata Pira falls in this, in this context of, of who am I? Yeah. 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 Okay. Any other comments, uh, disagreements, questions, thoughts? Anything is welcome. Rabbi Ronnie here. Yes. So, uh, now, yes, Ron, yes, yeah. Talk about, you know, uh, who we are, is it, and if you could comment on this, do you think we know 
we need to know what we are first and and what is what does that mean what we who is the we uh, right so 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 again you have right like robert schnauz is saying here in this paragraph you have the 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 philosophical definitions you have the scientific definitions you know we're a body with two legs and two feet and two this and two that two eyes and two ears etc uh but the deeper question of course of what you're asking is who are we and i think that depends really on the 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 knowledge that we have of ourselves of our deeper self now yeah exactly they're right so i mean you know we've spoken about the pop theory right many times i think there are four things that can indicate more or less to us who we are one is our personality like we said the different attributes that we have how much dosage of kindness or of justice that i receive uh what temperament i have what skills and talents i have that's personality that's number one and uh, number two i think the opportunities that we are given that's a part of who we are god gives us opportunities based on who we are because he believes that who we are can fulfill those opportunities whether it's helping the needy or uh you know writing a book or whatever it may be everyone has their own different opportunities that are presented to them each and every day rabbi can i interrupt you for just sure, a sure, sure, please can i can i just mention a tiny bit of tanya here mm -hmm. so in tanya we talk about the godly soul and the animal soul right and and they're two distinct things and yet they're both within our physical being is that correct mm -hmm. So, point. so what are we? Who are we? We need to first decide what we want to be. Right. Good Thoughts point. On that. Good point. That's right. There's a lovely story about a, an 11 year old. I think it was in Hoboken, New Jersey. Maybe, maybe I've shared the story before. Maybe I haven't. But uh, who, who was who was saved by a fireman after a fire erupted in his home. He was left behind. His parents and his siblings were able to escape, but he was left behind and a fireman came in storming through the flames and rescuing him at the very last second. Next day, he went back to the fire station. He went to the fire station with his family to uh, offer this fireman who had saved his life a gift and to thank the firemen in general for saving their lives. So this 11 year old, or maybe he was even younger, I don't remember, but um, he presented this gift to this fireman. And the fireman says, no, thank you. I don't want your gift. The family says, what do you mean? We'll give you any gift you want. Give you money, a ton of money if you need to, because you saved his life. And at the end of the day, his life is priceless. The fireman says, no, you don't understand. And then he looks at the 11 year old's eyes and he says, look, I'll tell you what type of gift I want. I want you to promise me that you'll live a life that was worth saving. That's the best gift you can give me. And in a way, we have to look in our own eyes, in the mirror and through the mirror in our own eyes every day, asking ourselves, am I living a life that was worth creating? And, um, you know, the Tanya, you're right, gives us uh, uh, some good ideas how to follow the divine soul and not the animal soul so that we want, so that we'll be able to answer that question with an affirmative yes. But it's a question we ought to ask ourselves. We have to make the right choices, like you're saying, Ron. It's the choices in our head or in our psyche. But we have to live a life that is worth creating, that was worth creating. I just want to say out loud, I love your stories. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ronnie. They're not my stories. They're stories you know, published. They're the stories you, you share. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, any other ideas, comments, thoughts? All right, so let's, let's continue a little more here on page 105. So after Robert Schnell says you dismisses the other um, 
uh, definitions from any other field but the who am I? Because at the end of the day, as mentioned, it's a very, very personal question. Here it continues with this paragraph. The question appears. Does anyone want to read? Anyone? Don't be shy. Maybe it's part, maybe it's a part of who you are if, uh, to read. So I'll wait. I, I was going to offer, but I think that there should be a point of choice. Maybe someone else would like to read. So if no, <laughs> I'll, well, let's wait and see. Is there anyone else? Anyone else? I was raising my hand before. Oh, good. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Deborah. Go ahead. Please. Okay, no, stop. Okay. Go for it. Yes. The, the question appears in the very first story of the Bible, the story of Adam and Eve. After committing their primal sin, they are frightened and hide themselves among the trees of the garden. The voice of God is heard calling unto Adam, where art thou? This question, like the entire tale, is emblematic of human life. If only man as an individual, if only the race of man as a whole, were able to forswear the sin of the tree of knowledge, the sin of knowing, for which there is no real corresponding need in the soul, he would be perhaps avoid the sin of responding to the question before it has arisen. When man knows more than he needs to know, when what he learns are no more than fragments of information, heaps of unrelated facts, which, whether they are correct or incorrect, become a barrier to experience itself. Mm -hmm. You want me to continue? Uh, maybe just a little bit more. Okay. Bit more, yeah. Were it not for the obfuscation inevitable in this formulation of answers without questions, that is, answers without inner immediate meaning, man might, like other creatures, have been able to feel the essence of himself more clearly and simply. There would be no problem about the direction he is to take. Right. Um, I, let, let, yeah, let me stop you here. So, so uh, um, and excuse the interruption, Deborah, but I think it's important to dwell on this, this big, big idea here. And that is that what Rabbi Stassi is saying, to simplify his words, is that sometimes the biggest enemy to the question, to our ability to answer the question of who am I, is our own mind. Now, why so? Because sometimes... Our mind plays games with us, plays games with us by, in a way, turning us into these sophisticated beings that, um, that through this sophistication, we lose the simple meaning of, of life or the simple uh, sense of the I. Uh, look, I, I would compare children and adults to make this point. I think children, in a way, are very happy beings. And um, they're very happy beings, I think, because they're much more in tune with themselves and with God altogether than adults are. What makes adults less in tune? It's the sophistication process that adulthood brings. That you start thinking too much and you start um, filling your mind with all sorts of, of ideas and maybe confusion. That then you lose that 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 sense of the I, and you lose the sense of life altogether. You know, I, I'll share with you, you know, I think this has very much the, I, I think one of the best, I mean, who am I to say what, what is good and what is best and what is <laughs> less good or less, whatever it is. But one of the great articles of Robert Steinsaltz is called The Twisted Creature. You know what, I'm gonna Google it right here and I'll attach it to um, the chat. But it speaks about the sin of Adam and Eve. There you go. I found it here. And I'm going to attach it to the chat. But it's, and I would encourage you really to read it. But um, it's just so beautiful. Such a beautiful piece. There we go. Attaching it to our chat. A twisted creature. Uh, I just just added it to the chat, but but uh, to summarize that article, which has a lot to do with this, is that Rabbi Stanz asked the question of how come uh, the Adam and Eve um, who ate from the tree of knowledge, that forbidden tree, 
weren't able to afterwards, knowing that they were going to be expelled from the Garden of Eden, weren't able to just go to the Tree of Life and eat from the Tree of Life, and then they would, God could not expel them. Tree, eating from the Tree of Life meant that you would live forever. What the sin of eating from the forbidden tree brought is that not only they were going to be expelled from the Garden of Eden, but also now Adam and Eve were going to die, that human beings had a lifespan. They could not live forever. So the question that he asks is that, well, all they could have done to prevent this punishment from kicking in was to go and eat from the tree of life, and then they would live forever, and that God could not punish them with a specific lifespan, because eating from the tree of life will make you live forever. Why didn't they just go to that tree and eat from it? And the answer that Rabbi Stans provides is a very powerful answer that has a lot to do with this, and that is that's because they ate from the tree of knowledge. What happened when they ate from the tree of knowledge? That they were so filled with knowledge, but knowledge that is so sophisticated that they lost the simple sense of what life means and what death means, what those simple notions of life really are. And therefore, when they ate from the tree of knowledge, they started saying to themselves, well, maybe the tree of life is really not a tree of life. Maybe that punishment is really not a punishment. And then what appears to be so clear in the eyes of others was so unclear to them because they became so sophisticated. That's why this article is called the twisted creature. Their mind became so twisted through sophistication. Happens a lot in our society, as Robert Stans points out. I think that we've become so sophisticated that we've lost the meaning of I love you. What does I love you mean? You mean like me, love me, do you really love me or you don't love me? What does a friend mean? Facebook came and told you a friend means that if someone accepts your friend request, is that a friend? I mean, what does it mean? We've become so sophisticated, so twisted that we've lost the simple meaning of notions. Simple meaning that, thank God, children still have because they haven't been sophisticated so, so, so heavily with, with life and with this idea that, you know, knowledge is, is, uh, is, is all that exists. And, and this is what Rabbi Shah is, is saying here in, in the 13th Pet of Rose, that Adam and Eve ate from that tree and automatically it brought them so much sophistication and therefore so much confusion that God had to ask them, where are you? Because they did not know who they were any, any more after eating from the tree of knowledge. And therefore, what Rabbi Shtaz is saying again is that sometimes the greatest enemy to the answer of who am I is the mind itself. Mm -hmm. and, Rabbi. And, and, and sometimes the, the remedy, and I'll just finish that. I don't know who said Rabbi here, but, but the, the, therefore the remedy sometimes is to say to ourselves, you know what? I'm putting my mind aside. Let me try and not think about this. Let me just try to act with my intuition, with, with my soul, not with my mind. And sometimes when we live life like that, then clarity comes back. Then we're able to see things in a very pure and innocent way. What the mind sometimes, uh, when the mind sometimes, you know, creates the opposite. Yes, who was going to say something? Rabbi, it's Mark. Yes. So you, you, you raise an interesting point in the sense that uh, Adam and Eve, pre-Apple, um, had more of a animalistic soul, and, and forgive me, for, maybe that's the wrong way of saying it, an, an animalistic perspective, um, because they were not twisted by their sophisticated intellect uh, or knowledge. Um, I, I sense that if we, I mean, is, is there a sense that Adam and Eve pre-Apple had more of a um, base soul or a more of a higher level soul closer to Hashem? That's a good question <clears throat> because, um, you know, simple is sometimes seen as naive or simple is sometimes seen as dumb. Um, but there is a level of simplicity that is purely holy um, because I'm so in tune that nothing can get in the way. No thought, it just flows. 
Um, and I think that's the type of soul that they had pre, pre uh, eating from the tree. They were so in tune with God. They may have not been sophisticated, but that's because there was no room for sophistication. It's almost like an artist, right? We mentioned this example many times, but if you ask a performer, what is the climax of his performance? He'll tell you when he doesn't feel himself. The music is flowing through him or an artist that is just so immersed in his painting that it just flows. There's no room for thinking, oh, should I paint my brush this way or that way? There's no room for the musician to say, well, should I play this note as a staccato, as a legato, whatever it is? No, there's no room for that. It, it just flows. It's, it, it's free of any sophistication. And, and I, Rabbi, the, the, when I think of, for example, an otter, a wolverine, um, whatever animal you think about, when they're in their space and truly being who they are, they are not distorted by the intellect, the wisdom that we were talking about. There seems to be a parallel between the pure instinctive flow of an animal and the pre-apple state of Adam and Eve. Hmm. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. And I think there's something quite beautiful, though, about it. There is an aspect of that that's, that's very holy, very pure, because it's so simple and flowing and, and unhindered, right? Yeah. yeah. Let, let, I just wanted to raise that. It, it's just a thought that came to me. Yeah. So no, 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 excellent point. Excellent Excuse point. Me. Excuse me, Rabbi? Yes, Deborah, yeah. I just put a message in your thing. Oh, um, I'm a little, you know, my heart is beating. <laughs> I see that. Yeah. Um, um, uh, that's a good point. Maybe we should what's rise his, it. What's his name? Last name? Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's good. Yeah. Um, I responded to you, but actually it went to someone else. But okay, it's good. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah, for, okay. for pointing this out. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, I just uh, so going back to this this big idea, I I want to I, I want to make a point uh, again. I think it's a point that's mentioned in Robert Schnauss's uh, article that I shared, a twisted creature, but. Um, just to use a different type of analogy. And I think that in a way, right? I mean, it's interesting to me because in, in this past class and the happiness hour today, we spoke about the idea of happiness and how people really work so hard for the pursuit of happiness. And then you go and you visit maybe a third world country and you see people really without means and without, without almost anything. And yet they seem to be the happiest people in the world. And you ask yourself, well, maybe everything that we're doing to try to achieve happiness should not be done because these guys don't have all these things that we're trying to do, and yet they seem to be so happy. And in a way, I think that, that that's, that's also because these people understood what Rabbi Stanzot is trying to, to explain here. And sometimes using the mind can corrupt you. <clears throat> sometimes all you have to do is just live life. And... And by living life without too much of the mind, you're, you're creating for yourself this deep sense of happiness. I think that's one of the practical examples in the world where we can see that this exists, this idea really very much exists. That, okay, when the mind is not so much in control, I mean, the mind is, don't get me wrong, right? And the way Robert Stanis is wrong. The mind, Robert Stanis was named, by the way, once in the Millennium Scholar. He was a person, he was a walking encyclopedia. So he's not saying that the mind is not important. But what he is saying is that when the mind is overused, it can become very, very corrupting, very, a big, a big obstacle. Sometimes we need to be able to put the mind aside and listen to the deeper self and, uh, and go with it instead of what, what the mind is telling us. You know, 
I'll share just one more Kabbalistic idea about this. That is that it's interesting to note that the word for mind in Hebrew uh, is, um, you know what, sechel. Now, sechel or brain, sechel. When we say that uh, someone is clever, yesh lo sechel. He's got, he's got a mind. Or he's not clever, ain lo sechel. Doesn't have a mind. Now, sechel also comes from the word shchol. Shchol in Hebrew, unfortunately, is used a lot in Israel to, uh, uh, it means orphaned, right? People that are, I don't exactly know what the translation is. People that have lost someone have a shchol. What's the translation, Gila? What would you say? I don't know. You know, I was just struggling with that. I don't know. Yeah. No. Um, so someone, someone who's experienced a loss in their family has a shchol. So it's the same word, that, that orphan-like feeling and, uh, and the word for mind. And that, in a way, I think is to, to teach us something that's very powerful, that the mind can be really a very good tool, but it's, if it's overused or if it's used in the wrong way, it can create a sense of void. It takes away what you ought to feel, what you ought to really appreciate that you have. And that's what Rabbi Schnauss again is saying here. We have to know how to use the sechel in the right way. If it's used in the right way, then it can enrich our lives. But if it's used in the wrong way, then it can take away things that we ought to know that we have and appreciate that we have them. That's really the big idea here. 